I'm looking forward. I thought this was a very interesting chapter. Um, okay, so chapter 19, when should you trust your predictions? And so the basic premise is just because you have a prediction doesn't mean that it's a good prediction. Uh, it could be that one could be using data that they shouldn't be. So um, if using data points out, way outside of like the appropriate range, uh, which is called extrapolation, um, or trying to use data in an inappropriate context. Their example is using a model built from breast cancer data uh, and trying to apply it to stomach cancer data. And this is considered not applicable. And so uh, there are various checks that you can run in order to see whether things are equivocal or applicable. Um, to decide whether or not to trust your predictions. And so this chapter discusses both of those and the equivocal um, uh, data points can be checked with the uh, probably package and then the applicability check can be done with the applicable package or probable package. Um, so first step is the equivocal results. So in some cases, there's just too much uncertainty to be able to use the model output. And checking um, equivocal results takes uh, using the probability like the predicted class or standard errors to create what is called an equivocal zone uh, to decide you know, whether or not to remove certain uh, predictions from uh, your model outputs. And so the example that they give is a, you know, two classes, two predictors, um, data set. They then run a, um, a logistic regression. So here's the logistic regression. And then they get the predictors from this, uh, from this model. And so then after that, you can start uh, plotting this uh, equivocal zone that we just talked about. So, um, so this is the the probability of a uh, predicted class probability, and so um, depending on what class it ends up like falling into, the probability of it falling into that class, the actual uh, model outputs, and the class that it is um, associated with. And then this equivocal zone, which is a band around um, the 50% or whatever the probability cutoff would be for your particular model. And so it seems to me, um, if, if anybody is aware, let me know, like that 50% seems to be the, the typical number. Um, you know, if you don't have like any other information to kind of base your equivocal zone off of. Uh, but you can always change this and also make the band either more strict or more lenient, depending on um, you know the particular context of the model. Any questions or thoughts on this? I thought it was very pretty. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice demonstration. Yeah, and so essentially these the uh, the points that are closest to the fitted class um, curve are the most uncertain. So um, slight things might change them from one class to the other. And so you can uh, decide to disqualify them by calling them equivocal. And uh, one thing to note is if you do remove anything from your, um, from your model, then you have to report uh, like, and this is called like the, report the reportable rate. Um, so the proportion of what is usable in your results, uh, you don't want to, you know, um, do that without disclosing what you did with your results. And um, so, within uh, sorry, I forgot. here it is. The probably package um, creates like functions for these equivocal zones, so that you can kind of tag your uh, model outputs with these attributes. Um, one thing to note is that it is an attribute. It doesn't actually change the class of your, um, of your predictions. And so this is what it looks like if you um, create a column pred with 
uh, with a equivocal zone. And then um, you specify the buffer that you want uh, around that equivocal zone and, and all that. And so your new um, table, I suppose, uh, has that column where it specifies, you know, this first row is within the equivocal zone, um, but it's not like this is going to be a whole new factor. If you run levels, you'll actually still only get two, um, but this allows you to um, continue using them in, in places where you do want all of your results um, and then be able to remove them for places where you don't want them. And, um, yeah. Just checking one of my notes. Any questions? Anything? Has anybody ever run into the equivocal zone? <laughs> I've never, never used anything like this before. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> I like, it's okay. interesting though, because like you know, it's uh, it's just the the example that's in the here. They're like, oh, the COVID test results. Mm. If if you're in the equivocal zone. They don't tell you your results because they're too uncertain. Right. Um, yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. Um, I am not sure if either of you have seen the show, uh, The Dropout. It's about the Theranos scandal. And oh, the, I've heard of it then, yeah. Yeah, it just not reminded that. me of it because they would report things, you know, that they shouldn't report. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I wonder if this applied there too. <laughs> I suspect um, in in my I've seen I suspect I've seen this before because I remember the geneticists talking about this when they got genetic results back for plant for our plant breeding. Sometimes the markers they're not the the way that they're like fluorescent in the way they report, and sometimes the fluorescence is just a little bit weird, and that's probably where it's in the equivocal zone where it's like. Mm. You're not really sure if it's A or B or or heterozygous A B. Yep. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Because there were some, I think they threw out they threw out those uh, those markers. Yeah, it seems like that's that's what to do. <laughs> so that's, that's just, so cool. Just that never you realized that. that's what what was going on in the background. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um. So the next question is like, does actually like removing these help improve accuracy? Uh, and so um, I, I would love some help like interpreting this graph because I got a little confused. Uh, but from what I understand, sorry, I guess like what is buffer? <laughs> does anybody know um, sure. what exactly this means? I bet that's the, you just said the word, what, what it, what that is uh it's the buffer it's the oh the zone how wide the equivocal zone is yeah. oh i see oh, okay thank you okay yes thank you okay uh that makes sense so looking at this chart um uh, they mentioned that accuracy improves but that means increasing the buffer up to 10 percent and the um the amount that you actually like improve your accuracy, as you can see, like it's uh, over here, now it's over here, it's very little, um, and you're removing 10% of your, uh, like of your 15, predictions. Yeah. 15, <laughs> isn't it? 15 by the end, but you only increase by a little less than 10, or no, yeah, only five. Am I reading it right? This so is like a, the reportable goes down from one to 0. 0.85, which mm -hmm. is 15, <laughs> not 10. Oh, okay. Is, is that right? Is, is that just a typo? Portable goes down here. One to 0. 0.85. And accuracy goes up. Like, like five. Six. Yes, I think, I think that's right. Federica, what do you think? Um, th this is uh, a bit uh, hard to to tell what the exact point is. It's about uh, uh, no point eight. I don't know, like three or four. 
and then yeah it goes down from one to 0.83 let's say that so it's slightly more than 10 10 percent it shows the accuracy or uh, improve the season but uh, uh, this 10 percent is uh, this on 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 this side the x-axis right yeah the buffer the buffer yeah that's the length of the so the difference between the accuracy and the reportable because yeah re reportable is the percent that say this was a covid test these are the these are the you're losing the amount of people you would tell the result at the end because your buffer is increasing so I in yeah. the paragraph below they're talking about well you have to make a decision on is accuracy more important mm -hmm. um, maybe you would ask those 15% of people mm -hmm. to take the test again to verify you know that sort of thing uh, right. that, this is the so the model performance and this one are the observed values yeah okay so I think what this means is so at buffer of 10 percent you only have whatever this is 84 percent of your um, predictions left is that right yeah yeah okay I, this might be a typo then maybe it should be nearly 15 percent Thank you. Yeah, it, seem, it seems like that 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 is uh, wider. Yeah. Yep. And then in in any case, the all the accuracy bumps up is from here to here, which is not mm. a terrible amount. Um, but I, I guess depending on the context, maybe in some cases that's very very important, and so it's kind of up to the modeler to decide um, what to do next. Yeah, maybe if you, if you if we have a look at the uh, the code uh, just above the graph, we see uh, how they how it may, um, how to make it, and uh, so the reportable rate here, which is the um, it's a function. Yeah, from I can pull it up. So I did try to run it. To see what the data set look like with the prediction. So the report will be from, from the prediction. Sorry. Because the accuracy we know what it what what that what is what is that what that is because uh, uh, we used to so consider the accuracy um, as a quite uh, normal step to do. The reportable rate, I have never used it. Uh, yeah, it seems like, yeah. Oh, sorry. This is something to use if you're using the equivocal zone, right? Yeah. Um, so that's a function, but the reportable rate function in itself. Okay, it's taking so long. The, the reportable rate function itself is uh, just inside the function. A, a, a little bit up. Uh, um, which is inside okay. the yes inside the equivocal zone yeah. result function that it is yeah, yeah. yes okay. okay this is taking its sweet time maybe we could come back to it um yeah but i understand of, much better now so thank you <laughs> a, lot, a lot of these things do take their sweet time now because <laughs> yeah. we're like resampling a billion times and all sorts of stuff that i've never done before yeah. 
Um, so this is so this is the data that actually feeds into that plot. Um, the buffer, the accuracy at that buffer, and then um, the value for either, or I'm sorry, this is the value for the accuracy or the reportable depending on the buffer, I believe. Thank you. And so then the chapter goes on to say um, that this is using the class prediction probability, but another option that might be better is the standard error probability um, to create that, that uh, buffer cutoff. It uses more than just the class probability and in particular cases can actually pinpoint uh, problematic cases, so not just um, uncertain cases. And, and then they, like here is for this particular data set, what it looks like to see the standard error as opposed to the class uh, probability. And in this case, they mentioned that this data set is pretty well behaved. Um, but it, it seems like it's another option for, uh, for calculating the equivocal zone and that um, that kind of goes into the realm of model applicability. That, that's how I understood that. Okay, that was the equivocal zone. Uh, any thoughts, questions? Not for huh. me. Thank you. Yeah. Next up is the uh, model applicability. So this is the question, is our model actually applicable in this case? Um, and it uses the applicable package to check and filter and all that. And so the example that they give, which I think is probably <laughs> another uh, one that might be like more, more common these days is um, the fact that COVID um, just kind of upended all time series ever. <laughs> and so in the, uh, the example is using the Chicago data set to predict um, uh, travel on the Chicago trains and uh, using the data and fitting and just a linear model. It's actually a really uh, good test or good model that produces a very, um, very good results, as you can see here, before 2020. So the question is, what happens when uh, your model is no longer applicable for your data because you know things change, but your model is not quite sensitive enough to see that the predictions are no longer good. Um, in this case, scroll down and calculate it using 2020 data you can see uh, the terrible model performance <laughs> visually, uh, but it like it actually didn't change the standard errors enough to really capture um, you know, what exactly was going on. And so, uh, so you want to measure what is called an applicability domain to see if the data points are quote unquote too far. And um, similar to before that, what too far means uh, relies a lot on, uh, too far from the training data, I should say. It's, it very much depends on the context and you know, domain knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you can um, use uh, things like the applicability domain to try and get to you know, understanding like, is this quote unquote too far? And so, you uh, essentially what you do is um, you can use uh, PCA and or principal component analysis to be able to calculate this applicability domain. Um, it's a good method, but again, there's no way to just like straight out say like this is too far from the center of um, of the PCA training uh, or training set scores. But, but you can at least start to visualize it and then make determinations and stuff like that. So first up, you 
plot your training set before your new sample of data. Um, and you, and so this is what is considered like quote unquote normal. And then you add the new sample to see how extreme things are. And the higher a score is, that means um, the more of that training set that's close to the data center uh, than the new sample. That makes sense. So this is from the original training set data. Uh, correlating two of the train um, stations from Chicago called Austin and California, which are also both location names, which I thought was funny. Um, and then you can see the PCA scores and the distances, and then uh, like a nice little uh, distribution to see how far they are from, from center. And then you overlay the new data and see how far it is. And you can see uh, there's some uh, new data that's nice and snug within this, this kind of range of PCA values. And then you have 2020 data, which is like all the way over here, like not even close. <laughs> um, and so you could, uh, that looks like a nice like visual representation of, of what's happening that uh, it's very extreme, perhaps it should not be included. So this Again, is like so. This is like data that the essentially it's like saying this is data that the model hasn't seen before or wasn't trained on. Yeah, it was. and therefore, and therefore, it's out of it, it's going to it may give you spurious results. That, that that's what this is saying, pretty much, right? Is it? The data hasn't been seen before because it's from a new sample or because it's so extreme? Maybe both. Mm -hmm. I, I would say more that it's extreme. Yeah, I, I think so too. It's not within the range that it's seen before. Right, like something something else is if, happening. If <laughs> thing, you know, if you put, so it was trained on what March or like 2016 data. If you put 2017 yeah. data in, it probably fit fine, right? Right. It's, it's very similar. Yep. It's like, you know, and and maybe it's something that like it would be close to the edge or something like that. But the question is more the, the ex extremity like of the new data. Cool. This is a really neat method. Yeah, I like it. I I like how like. It's like, oh yeah, like I can see if something is up <laughs> um, and kind of flags it for you. Um, and so this applicable package can also help uh, do various other things. Um, so I looked up this threshold argument and uh, they mentioned here that it, it determines how many components are used in the distance calculation. And mm. so I like, welcome interpretation of exactly what that means like does that mean it's more rigorous or or something else um, so yeah. it's it's pulling in enough components to account for 95 99 percent of the variation mm -hmm. that's a lot of components potentially yeah, right? <laughs> um, um, yeah when i try to run this um i ran into an error fortunately and um, but I'm gonna play around with it some more because I do want to get better. It's, my, it's always my understanding that if you if you use too many principal components, you're you're overfitting. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, my, but this then uh, the result say, the output says nine components were needed. Right. Oh, so it tells you. Okay. Oh, there's 20 predictors, and it made nine components, and that covers. 99 percent of the variation okay yeah that's that's the threshold so it's the it's a cutoff probability that you say outside that value it's always that then that is used to uh establish how many components were needed or the the best uh mm, maximum number of components uh, yeah but how that so how 
do you use this applicability uh, adding principal component and then so you you have this uh, result which says uh, you need 20 predictors mm -hmm. to be for, for the model to be applicable well, so when you use new new data uh, to the same model mm -hmm. you find you'll be able to use that model because the results of the model are applicable so are within a certain range to say that uh, they pred the prediction of this model will be uh, can be trusted right I, yeah i think like this is the one from the 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 training set distance for distribution so the distribution from that center of that plot and you can see um uh like at what point you, so i think the example they gave is for um like 50 percent have a distance less than 3.7 somewhere around here um and that that's also reflected like in this in this black uh, plot but then if you add the new data with the 2020 data um it's like all over now <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like all, yeah exactly <laughs> it's like way over on the other side <laughs> crikey yeah yeah um and so that can at least flag that this data should be like like whether or not these data points are even applicable for or if your model is even applicable for these data points <laughs> Yeah, and cool. so that's that's the two parts that they mentioned: the uh, equivocal zone and the applicability domain, with the uh, probably package and the applicable package. Um, who will kind of help you figure out and make those determinations. Um, and uh, one question I had, you know, from the group is like. I can imagine that this is part of uh, like one's model workflow that, you know, like PCA analysis, um, you know, checking, uh, ch checking model results and plotting it with like the class predictions and, you know, specifying a, a nice buffer and things like that. Um, I was just curious if that's generally how it's done. Like this is always part of, one's model workflow to you know make sure that they're that they can trust their predictions uh, i think it, that that would be uh, to use when you build a model that you plan in uh, to to use with new data so you have uh, you you are building a model which is reusable mm -hmm. not just that that it's for a certain uh, type of um, like uh, model production sector. So you, you build a model for predicting some phenomenon that are repeating in, you know, like traffic in, uh, in town, uh, those things like uh, flights, uh, delay, the things that are even weather somehow. But if you are doing a study, so you are you are going you are doing like uh, control versus uh, um, so you, you are doing um, a model specific for just for that data for that set of data that cannot and it's not planning to be used for 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 new data because the new data would be completely different. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to use applicable. You don't need to check the applicability of the model. I see. If, yeah. So it depends uh, if you are in production. Maybe that mm -hmm. that would be that would be very useful. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. This is all I had. That was good. Thank you. Really yeah. interesting. 
Yeah. I, I imagine at the end we'll like uh, fit our model to our Ames data set and run these sorts of things on it to, to you know, say they built a new neighborhood or something like that. And you can yeah. see how far out some like like a new like a new house is compared to the rest sort of thing. Right. Oh, yeah. Looking forward to that. We're almost there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, 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 we missed two, two chapters. So next week, I was uh, thinking that it would be nice if we share the chapter. I don't know, like, uh, either of you and me, we can, like, divide the chapter and tell each other what what we want to discuss about uh and then the last chapter as well so i put down my name but you know I, i'd like to have a discussion so we we can have this this last two weeks for uh pulling out um all our doubts about using tidy models so maybe uh, and then put it on there I, 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 I would like to add one more week for um, sharing uh the data that we use or maybe one sample data that we use applying to tidy models like a case study to showcase how to use tidy models in on our data maybe that sounds kind of yeah. fun i don't yeah i'll have to figure out if i can share my data at all <laughs> even even on the screen but uh that, that would be really interesting i know that they use similar ensemble models and things like that in yeah. other parts of the company but uh i think it would be fun to kind of do the same thing but my understanding is that my little my little my little mac probably would take all week to run <laughs> <laughs> the the yeah. mod because we have millions and millions of rows of data so <laughs> yeah i mean so, I, yeah you don't um, have to don't have to do it on all of it though do you so you can filter it <laughs> yeah, or even sam even sample it you know yeah okay one percent sample <laughs> yeah yeah i would love that because like for me what i struggle with is like I, I don't do modeling at work and so i find interesting data sets and i'm like oh i'd like to fit a model but like i do it but i'm like i actually don't know if i'm doing this <laughs> did i miss a crucial step or you know something like that um I'm sure, I'm sure we, I'm sure we will. I'm sure I will. I'll speak so, for myself. I'm just uh, like, I just need, like, I, I need to, like, someone to check my work. <laughs> so, um, for sure. Cool. We'll get Federica to check our work. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> someone who knows what she's doing a little bit, you know. All right. Thank okay. you. Thanks so thank much you. for the tour. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great week. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Ta-ta.